Thank you, everyone. Um, I think you all know me by now, but um, I'm Kieran and uh, co-founder of the BitShifters Collective. So I've been making uh, demos and uh, games to BBC for the last five years or so, uh, ever since I joined Starlet, actually. Uh, and because it was my idea to uh, perhaps do masterclasses in these sessions, I thought it's unfair, really, if I do the first one. Otherwise, uh, yeah, it's not fair to ask somebody else to do that. And um, interrupt seems to be a common topic, something that people have uh, mentioned a lot. And so I thought, well, um, why don't we start there? And I'd uh, love to hear your feedback on uh, whether you think this is kind of a good, um, good use of time, whether the kind of content's the right level, uh, whether you think it's actually useful, did you learn anything? And um, yeah, so let's get started. There we go. Um, so yeah, disclaimer just to start, obviously we've got about sort of 15, 20 minutes here. Um, it's somewhat simplified for the purposes of explanation, uh, but there's a lot more you can find online. Uh, a lot of this I've taken out of the advanced user guides. Um, I seem to be the only person that prefers the new advanced user guides, but there you go. Um, all of the information for the BBC is in here. Uh, if you want to learn just about interrupts in general uh, on the 6502, then there's a, a massive great big tutorial on 6502.org, uh, which I thoroughly recommend um, going through as well. So, I guess the first question is why does everyone want to um, learn interrupts or, or use interrupts for their, uh, for their games and, and for their programs? And there's a number of things that you can do with interrupts. And uh, so these are some of the examples of, of things you might want to do. So playing music in the background, uh, that's obviously a, a common thing for games and demos. Uh, we talked a lot about um, uh, sprite flicker and trying to reduce that. Uh, well, if you can time your sprite plot routines relative to the raster, then that can be a really big help in avoiding flicker. Uh, any code that has to run sort of time critically or on a regular uh, regular basis. I remember Sarah, when she was talking about white light, talked about uh, the player controls in white light are um, always serviced at uh, 50 hertz. They feel smooth and responsive, even if some of the parts of the game uh, don't run at, uh, at that speed. Uh, obviously, Elite classically uh, changes modes two thirds of the way down the screen. Uh, and so interrupts allow you to change mode or change color palettes at specific points. Um, and then obviously on the beep, doing anything I.O., so doing disk or tape, uh, if you're loading, then this is a blocking operation. So if you want to do something else at the same time, uh, then you need to use interrupts. And uh, perhaps the most extreme example of that would be uh, Bad Apple or the Beebnik demo, where actually it's, it's doing a whole load of rendering and music at the same time as uh, streaming data of disk constantly. Uh, and then there's some of the advanced graphic effects uh, like vertical rupture. So uh, not just demos, but even in games. So uh, Tricky's Frogger uses uh, vertical rupture just to help with um, the memory layout of the screen and avoid having to do um, uh, software sprites and clipping and things like that. And then finally, things like Stable Raster, uh, which is our current sort of state of the art in terms of advanced demo effects. Uh, I guess the first point to really um, understand is that interrupts are external to the CPU, uh, kind of by definition, right? So the CPU will just sit there and execute code forever unless something interrupts it, right? And so interrupts come from hardware devices that are somewhere else in the system. And they're literally connected um, to, to one of two pins on the, uh, on the 6502 chip, because uh, there's two types of interrupts, and so therefore there's, there's literally two different pins. Uh, there's non-maskable interrupts, uh, and these are used usually for data transfer uh, from disk, uh, but we're not gonna talk about uh, those in this session, uh, but there's maskable interrupts or IRQs, and IRQ short for uh, interrupt request. And they're called maskable interrupt because the flag, um, the CPU just um, ignores, um, it ignores the interrupt. Um, but that doesn't mean that the thing hasn't happened, right? The, the piece of hardware in the system has still caused the interrupt, and actually you can still detect uh, that that interrupt has, uh, has taken place, uh, even if you've asked the CPU to just ignore it uh, for the time being. And that can also be very useful in certain situations. So what happens when an IRQ is received, when that signal is activated on the, on the CPU pin? Uh, well, actually, the, the CPU will finish the execution of its current instruction, uh, it's a little asterisk there because there's quite a lot of subtlety in the timings of what the CPU does and when it responds to interrupts. Uh, but again, way out of scope of this discussion and only really of interest to people that are doing um, 
uh, doing emulators. And so if you want to know more about those kinds of details, then I recommend speaking to one of the uh, emulator experts like Sarah or, uh, or Rich Tobert Watkins, uh, people like that. Uh, but the CPU will finish executing the instruction. Uh, it saves a program counter and importantly the stack regis uh, status register sorry, on the stack. Uh, and then it always executes this operation where it does a jump through the address that is stored in these very last two bytes of the memory map. Uh, and so it doesn't actually jump to FFFE, but it looks at the contents of FFFE and FFFF and it looks at those two, two bytes, it takes the address and it jumps to that address. Uh, and this is for IRQs, and that's the interrupt handler for IRQs. If it receives an NMI, it actually goes through a different vector. It goes through FF, FA. But again, I'm not going to worry about that uh, here. And so what, what is an interrupt handler, right? Well, what, what do we mean by that? Well, it's something that needs to be invisible uh, to the main program that's running. Obviously, 6502 is a very simple chip. There's no sort of threading. Uh, and so the, the main program that's running is just literally stopped. Uh, and the execution is changed to the interrupt handler, and whatever it does, it needs to, uh, when it's finished, it needs to return the main program running as if, as if nothing had happened. Uh, and so in practice, this means uh, preserving our registers, uh, using the stack is usually the simplest way to do this, uh, but you've also got to return with RTI, uh, return from interrupt. Uh, it's not equivalent to use RTS, just because of the way that the program counter is, uh, is saved. And so, um, you know, the observance among you, FFFE is right at the top of the memory map. It's in the MOS ROM, right? So the ROM is fixed. Uh, and this means that uh, when the IRQ comes in, um, the address that uh, it's going to jump to to handle it is, is, is already fixed for us. We can't change that. And uh, on a Model B, this is actually uh, DC1C. And on a master, that's uh, E59E. And you can see this by just firing up your emulator and uh, going into the memory map uh, view uh, and seeing that the, what the what addresses are uh, at that address. And so I guess the next question is, well, what does the MOS interrupt handler uh, actually do? Uh, that's perhaps a little bit premature. We've talked about hardware devices, so we should really think about what devices can generate IRQs before we think about how they uh, get handled. So on the Beeb, uh, these are the main um, pieces of hardware that will generate IRQs. Uh, there are others, but these are kind of the main ones you'd, you'd come across. So, any kind of serial operations, like the serial port or the cassette, it'll generate an IRQ when a character is received, right? Something needs to be done with that character. And um, so ask the CPU and, uh, to deal with it. Now, video chip, um, the vertical sync pulse is a really important interrupt. That's the one time we know um, what's going on with the, um, uh, the video signal and allows us to synchronize things uh, relative to that. There's a number of hardware timers in the system, and again, we'll talk about that a little bit later, and when one of those timers reaches zero, when it counts down to zero, it'll generate an IRQ, and that's also very, very helpful. Uh, analog conversion, for instance, a keyboard, another obvious one, right? We, as soon as somebody presses a key on the keyboard, we want to be able to respond to that instantly so the system feels responsive, uh, and so that generates IRQs. Even the printer ports, and, and actually the, the one megahertz bus, it has a line on the one megahertz bus port that is connected directly to um, the IRQ pin on the CPU. Yeah, and even the light pen can generate interrupts, but obviously not something that's used very much these days. So what does the MOS interrupt handler actually do um, when it jumps to that code? Well, actually the first thing it does is it stores the accumulator in FC of zero page. Uh, and at this point, this is very much a, um, a BBC convention, right? This is a convention uh, for the, um, the BBC's operating system, but it's important to know that because if we're going to write our own um, interrupt handlers, then we need to be able to play nicely uh, most of the time uh, with the OS. And um, the next thing it does is, is to check whether the IRQ was caused by a, a break instruction. Uh, those are known as software interrupts. Again, not going to cover them here. Uh, they'll do other things like try and figure out what the, um, the error is and put the error messages on the bottom of the stack and stuff like that. But, um, the thing that we're mostly interested in, that because the address of the um, interrupt handler is fixed in the ROM, luckily for us, it then does another indirect jump, but this time through the vector table, and that is in RAM. So page two is, um, contains most of the vectors for the operating system, and it will jump through the IRQ1 vector, and that's stored at um, uh, 204. And this normally, normally uh, in a freshly booted system, will point to the main routine that services interrupts. 
And uh, again, on the Model B, this will be uh, DC93, and on the Master, this will be E5 FM. So again, you can do this, you can fire up your emulator, or just your B, and just look at the contents of 204 and 205, and you should see those uh, addresses. And then uh, at the end of the service routine, once it's finished servicing the interrupts, uh, it then does another indirect jump, uh, this time through ILQ2 vector. Uh, and this is stored at uh, 206. And again, if you follow that uh, code and see what's on the other end of it, it's very simple. It just loads the uh, accumulator back out to zero page and it does an RTL. And at that point, like the rest of the program should just continue where it left off and should be none the wiser that uh, the interrupt has occurred. So it's probably worth now just going through kind of what order the the MOS services interrupts and, and the sort of thing that it does when the interrupts take place. Because again, if we're, in, if we're interested in um, writing our own interrupt handlers or uh, changing the way interrupts are managed within the system, then it's important for us to know what the operating system is doing or what it's expecting so that we can make decisions about whether we want to play nicely with the operating system or uh, particularly if you're writing something basic perhaps and you just want to uh, write your own uh, interrupt handlers in order to say play some music, but otherwise you want the rest of the system to behave as it would normally do. Or you might be at the other end of the spectrum where you're in sort of tricky territory where you just want to shut out the OS entirely and just take over the entire machine and, uh, and not uh, and do everything yourself. Uh, and so the first thing it'll do is try and just process any uh, serial data coming in and out, uh, just to keep that um, that data being uh, being sent and received at the, the rate it's expected. Uh, next, it'll try and process the vSync. And the sort of things it does on vSync, it actually updates the flashing colors we were just talking about. Uh, once the flashing color timer is timed down, it will uh, switch those over. And again, the reason it does that is uh, so that you don't get any um, color tearing um, whilst the uh, screen's being displayed. So it happens during the vSync period. Um, it triggers the vSync event, yeah, event number four. Uh, and I believe it also sets up some other timers within the system as well. Uh, the next, um, the next interrupt that's the service, and probably the, probably the most important, there's a lot that hangs off the centisecond timer uh, within the OS. So this runs at 100 hertz, uh, and so every time that reaches zero, quite a lot of things get processed um, by the system. So it updates the time variable, which you can uh, rely on. Again, you'd rely on that in basic and other parts of uh, other OS calls. Um, it actually processes sound, so you get a 10 millisecond slice of sound. It'll update your envelopes and. Uh, update the sound value sent to um, sent to the uh, sound chip, and it even does the keyboard repeat as well within the um, center second timer um, service. Uh, so that's quite an important one. And again, if we're thinking about wanting to change the timers within the system for our own means, then yeah, we need to be careful uh, what the side effects of that might be. Uh, analog conversion again, uh, key press of course, very important one. Again, quite interestingly, it doesn't process the key there and then, it just stores the value. Uh, the key's actually processed uh, in the timer, uh, timer handler. Yeah, and even the printer port will signal when it wants, um, wants another character. So if you want to write your own IRQ handler, as we said, it's uh, convenient that everything's been um, uh, indirected through vectors that are in RAM, so we can change the value of those. Uh, and so if you want to go before uh, the OS has had a chance to process the interrupts, then you intercept IOQ1 vector. Uh, if you're happy to go afterwards, you want the system to just work as it is, but you want to add some things on the end, uh, then you can intercept IOQ2 vector. Normally, if you want to um, interact with the operating system in a sort of uh, friendly way, then you would save the vector contents um, uh, when you replace them with your own, and you would use that uh, to pass back on to the previous routine after you've had your, your go. Uh, and I sort of use this asterisk here again with sort of unrecognized interrupt because uh, it's up to you really, if you go before the MOS, you have to make a decision as to whether you're going to sort of consume uh, and, uh, and claim that, um, uh, that interrupt, that thing that happened uh, and, or, or not, right? If you pass it on to the MOS, say for example, the VSIC interrupt, you decide to sort of uh, acknowledge that, uh, it means that when you pass the, um, the interrupt back to the MOS, it doesn't know that these things happen. So your, your colors are gonna stop flashing. That may or may not be a problem to, uh, for you. And, uh, and similarly with things like uh, the timer, if you uh, interrupt the timer and um, change the way that works, you may find that your sound stops working. Uh, but then this depends whether you're using the OS for sound or 
Uh, or if you just want to take over everything, you can just do an RTI and, uh, and you just deny the OS uh, the ability to process uh, any of them. In general, in IOQ handlers, you should try and avoid OS calls. Um, a number of reasons, uh, mostly because um, the, the OS space, workspace that's used uh, could well get, uh, get trampled uh, or be conflicting within an interrupt. Um, you should try and be as quick as possible is always a recommendation. This is mostly to keep the system sort of uh, responsive. Uh, again, this could be completely broken or, or abused in the case of demos where I think um, you know, many hundreds of milliseconds uh, within an interrupt to do something like uh, the Beatnik demo. Uh, and then this is probably the bit that uh, catches people out or is probably a, perhaps unexpected, but interrupt routine should be re entrant uh, And that means that if you're in the middle of servicing an interrupt, it's entirely possible for another interrupt to occur. And if you think about what happens, of course, the CPU is just gonna put aside whatever it is that you're doing, it's gonna complete that instruction and it's gonna re-enter the whole loop again uh, from the very start. And um, this definitely happens if your interrupt ends up being uh, many, many uh, milliseconds uh, long. So a little bit of code snippet here to interrupt, uh, intercept, sorry, the, uh, the IRQ, um, it's all, Quite straightforward. Uh, first of all, you need to disable interrupts, uh, stop the uh, CPU from uh, doing anything with them. Of course, we don't want to be changing uh, vectors and call addresses. Uh, if an interrupt comes in in the middle of uh, us doing this, then we have very unpredictable results. If we're being polite, we should store the, uh, the contents of the old vector, uh, and then we should install um, the address of our new uh, IRQ handler before we re-enable the vector. And then the uh, IOQ handler itself, um, again, if we're going to do things properly and uh, be friendly with the, with the OS, the very first thing we should do is actually um, pull out the um, saved accumulator value and push that on the stack. Uh, and that's the reason for that is if we have a re-entrant interrupt, uh, the first thing the OS is gonna do when the whole circle starts again is it's gonna store the accumulator uh, in this zero page area here. And so the original one uh, will get corrupted so we need to store that on the stack. If you're planning to use the X and Y registers, then of course you need to store those as well. And so push those on the stack. Obviously on a master, you can use um, uh, the Fox and Phi uh, opcodes to save yourself uh, a couple of bytes there. Uh, and then you service your interrupts in the middle. Uh, you do whatever, whatever magic it is you want to do there uh, and then put everything back before you return. And so at the end there, get the um, X and Y and accumulator values put the accumulator back into zero page where the OS is expecting it, and then uh, vector through the previous um, handler. Or if you're tricky, you can just return and uh, deny the uh, OS a chance to do anything with those uh, interrupts. Now that's great. I've kind of told you how to create an interrupt handler. I haven't actually told you how to use, <laughs> how to use it to do any of these cool things, right? So, um, but at least, you know, hopefully by now we have a sort of a uh, reasonable understanding of what I, interrupts and IRQs are and what happens um, when they come in. Uh, and I think in order to do some of these effects, we need to think about, well, what hardware does the BBC have that can help us uh, achieve some of these things? And it turns out that it's actually the VIAs that are the hero here. And um, so most hardware devices are connected to the CPU through one of these chips. Uh, it's the 6522 and the versatile interface adapter. And uh, it's created by, uh, by MOS when they created the 6502. Uh, it's a companion chip uh, to help things interface with the CPU. And um, uh, fortunately as well, it also has two programmable timers and they run at one megahertz in the beep. So that's a nice uh, high resolution timer. Um, and again, we're lucky we have two of these in the BBC. There's the system via and the user via. And so the system via connects to uh, the speech hardware uh, sound, sound chip, uh, keyboard, video, analog, uh, and even CMOS on the master. Uh, and there's also uh, the user via, which perhaps uh, unsurprisingly um, is connected to the user port and the printer port. Uh, and so I think I'm kind of leaving you perhaps unfairly on a bit of a cliffhanger here, but um, I think for, for games and demos, you know, the thing that we're most interested in is um, tapping into the vSync interrupts so that we know uh, where the raster is and also these timers, um, these mysterious one megahertz timers. And so I think when people often say they're having trouble with interrupts, um, quite often what they really mean is that they're having trouble programming uh, 
the system via usually uh, to get it to fire interrupts when they want uh, in a predictable way and perhaps also um, without having side effects or interfering with the OS. So uh, I think that's kind of hopefully a, a good grounding in, in sort of interrupts basics uh, and sort of how it works within the system. Uh, but really the bit that you're probably all most interested in is that how to program the system via. And I think that's something that we, we should probably spend a bit more time digging into in part two, uh, how to actually set up um, the vSync interrupt uh, and particularly the time interrupts and then how to use the two together in order to do um, interesting things that we've uh, on our list. But um, hopefully that's a good grounding in sort of the basics, as I say, and we now have a, a reasonable understanding of what interrupts are for the 6502 and uh, what causes interrupts on the BBC and how the OS uh, handles it. Thank you.